Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for um, just being present in this, in this space and allowing me to just share these words with you. First and foremost, I want to go ahead and recognize two important things. One is that um, we are standing on occupied territory. We are standing on occupied land. So I want to, I want to give respect and recognition to the first peoples of this nation. You, Shoshone, Paiute, Navajo, and so forth. Indigenous people. I want to recognize them to begin with because they are the bridge in many ways, them and their knowledge that can share with us to go forward in so many different things in terms of social justice, social change. The second thing I want to recognize is an incredibly beautiful woman right back there who gave me life, who gave me courage, and has raised me and brought everything in the world to me. That's my mamita, Paulina Diaz. She's just right back over there. And I get emotional when I talk about her because, you know, she did it mostly on her own. And raising four kids, of course, my father was there, but he was working literally all the time. Two jobs in Brooklyn, New York. Hardly ever got to see him. So there she was, taking us back and forth to school, to the grocery store, across subways, across trains, buses, everything. She did it on her own. She did it on her own because she's just badass like that, <laughs> but she also had a village to it was her family. Family of 15 brothers and sisters that literally lived all in the same building in Brooklyn. And there we were, having parties, literally just going back and forth between apartment doors and so forth, enjoying life, enjoying each other. Because family does that, community does that, right? And so one day as I was growing up and I was moving forward in my life in Brooklyn, I wanted to go see the world. I wanted to see things that were different. I wanted to get outside my cage. And I had a very deficit response to my own community, to my own neighborhood. And I realized I just wanted to see something different. My mom totally supported me. And so she let me go on this trip to Idaho, of all places. <laughs> and there I was. And I was stuck in some university and college in Idaho with a scholarship that I was really grateful for. And I really enjoyed it at first. But things started changing. Tokenization is interesting like that. When you become brown, you realize it more than anything. One day, not too long you know, into, my, into my education, I was out on a motorcycle ride because I was hanging out with friends and just enjoying life. And I became reckless at one point in terms of my education. And there I was in this motorcycle ride, and I had no idea what happened. No idea at all. That semester was completely blank to me. I woke up, I can't even remember how long afterwards, weeks, months, I just can't remember. I woke up afterwards and I was in a coma and I suffered from a traumatic brain injury. And the most powerful thing I saw that was first there when I woke up was my mother's face and then my family. And I started crying because I don't know what happened. Like, I didn't know where I was and what was going on at the same time. After some time, I was able to recover. I was able to walk again, talk again, do all those things all over again. And I was able to decide that I really wanted to go back into education. I wanted to do it right this time. And I wanted to make sure that I represented my family well because my mother, my father, and everybody in my family they came and left everything behind in Brooklyn, New York, just to be there with me, just to make sure that nothing bad happened to me. I'm going to go ahead and show a few pictures. It's all put together, thanks to us right here, and it's actually perfect like that, because life is like that. Life is just a whole uh, nature of photos and visual images and messages, and I just think it's powerful. You'll notice the picture where I'm with my brothers and sisters. We're hanging out on the top bunk bed in a one-bedroom apartment, and just chilling right there, with our afros out and so forth. <laughs> and it was, it was a good life. If you also notice my time in Idaho, next to certain friends who I felt like I connected best with, because there were also people of color from marginalized communities just like myself. And then you'll notice the moment that truly changed everything, my accident, when I was in a coma. 
And I think the worst part wasn't that I was in a coma, it's that they took off all my beautiful hair at the same time. So that's all good. I can live with that because I'm okay now. Afterwards, I decided to go ahead to South Valley University, and uh, I just flowered from there. At UVU, I was able to explore myself in this college environment. I decided to re-articulate and re-understand who I was and go forward from there. And I had, a really, I had a really beautiful understanding of people and social justice and pushing those, those, those messages forward and changing everything. But it was also an education that was involved in my community as well as just officially within academia. The thing for me is that what I see, and you'll probably not see it here, but you'll see it there, is that the women of my life have always shaped who I am. They've always informed how I go about things and have built my knowledge. You see in the corner right there, my abuelitas, my grandmothers. From a piece that Sylvia Solis wrote not too long ago, a letter from a place called Land to My Children, she talks about how our grandmothers, the matriarchal line of our families, our mothers, share the wealth and knowledge that can change our societies. You'll notice also my two young pink kings right there, my rainbows, my babies. Just right there in the corner. And this is what I hope that they understand as well, that they have a matriarchal line of power and knowledge that can be spread to them, and they can go forward with that knowledge to take on the world and all its structures. Because as we look at resistance, as we look at social justice and activism and challenging these things, there's a lot to take into place. For me, it's quite simple. It's not it's not complicated in the sense of what we have to do, but it's simple in the sense of what we have to pursue. First of all, we have to understand that the bridges we built in our communities must go through a process of decolonization. We must go through a positive process of decolonization ourselves. By doing that, we must first come to love and understand ourselves in a way that hasn't been done before. We have to learn that we as individuals do not exist we as family and communities, as collective blocks, exist. And therefore, with that understanding, we go forward in a whole new sense of indigeneity that shares more about who we are and what we understand. Now, that being said, when we come to that point of contact, when we understand our decolonized selves, we can then begin to build bridges. We can then go ahead and, sh and shut down to the borders that separate us as people, as communities. So our struggle must not only be intersectional in that sense, but it must be building at the same time and go forward in that way. And there's a difference because I don't want to go ahead and share this message of we have to build community, we have to create connections, we have to build bridges. Because then it's all, this is whole kumbaya colorblind thing that can sometimes get into play, right? And that's oftentimes through a white lens, through a very Eurocentric lens, that we have to communicate with each other. But sometimes what we need to understand as well is that there is something called self-determination and that people have the power to be self-determinant on their own. So when you want to work with somebody and they don't want to work with you, that's okay. That's all right, especially amongst indigenous societies. Now, as a Latino male, who is a New Yorkino, you know, that's my place, that's my space. Decolonization is something very interesting. It's an ongoing process, it doesn't stop. There is no end. In the same way, there really was no beginning. So I have to understand that component myself. The Vita Kaili speaks of Tahiba. Tahiba is a tongue and principle of socio spatial relations in which you acknowledge land over there, and therefore borders is not an issue. Distance is not an issue. All these other obstacles are not issues because oceanic people in travel the currents. Knowledge travels upon the oceans. It is fluid, which is a very powerful component to who we are as a decolonized self, all right? Because once we can do that, we can understand much more about building bridges. 
building community and going forward and assisting the social justice, social justice movements that are currently occurring and pushing on to other places. One of my favorite authors, Juan Prieto, from um, UCLA, is an incredible author talking about the undocumented movement in the past. In the past, what it is, and where it's going. He critiques it especially in the sense of what the dreamer movement was about before. Now, I have to acknowledge my privilege in that sense. I'm a citizen and an able-bodied male in this country, among other things, I'm, I am educated and so forth, which is a constant set of privilege checking that we need to do, that I need to do. But Juan Prieto, he speaks of the dreamer movement itself as something that was very much deep into anti-blackness, something that was not queer quite, quite yet, something that was just still limited in many ways by boundaries that people and governments have set upon them, not taking on larger narratives, and he speaks of movement evolving. And when movement evolves, it includes many more people. So it doesn't just include students in specific individual bodies, but now it includes entire collectives, it includes families, adults, people who've been here before because they dream dreams too, as well as us. And so in this sense, movement and the pursuit of social justice is really never ending. It is never ending, but neither is it limited, bordered, or anything like that. Movement can be indigenous in so many ways, and yet we still have to be careful about that term. We can't co-opt that term to just go ahead and say movement is indigenous, but we have to understand the implications. We have to dig deep in roots and understand that movement can be so many things. It can be queer, it can be black, it can be intersectional, it can be amongst various places. And we have to do that if we're gonna do something. For me, this change does not happen within policy, within structures, or retransforming those structures, because guess what? Power does that. It just simply shapes itself to the structure and what exists. For me, the pursuit of change is truly something local. It's place-based. It's within you and your community. And the bridges you build within those communities to create something new, an alternative, whatever it is, and you push forward with that, and you don't stop. You constantly reflect on it, you constantly critique it, because that's the beauty of reflexivity, that's the beauty of indigeneity, that you always cycle back and understand the cosmologies, the spiritualities that envelop all around you to shape who you when they can become and when they can be. My young children are going to grow up in a world full of issues, full of injustice, full of things that happen to communities left and right. But we have to begin to see each other. We have to begin to understand each other behind the obstacles of what people oftentimes create against us. These issues right here, whether it be Standing Rock, Black Lives Matter, homelessness, etc., 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 these issues affect us all. We can't isolate and then just go ahead and pursue just one thing. We have to understand the beauty of everything at the same time. That we're all interconnected and therefore our struggles are interconnected. A movement of many movements is required. 